God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. So glad that you could be with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about being in it to win it. 1 Corinthians 9, while you find your way there, a uh, couple of quick things. First of all, our annual report is coming up in the month of March. Uh, once a year, our board of deacons and trustees and our pastors bring a report to you of the activity of our congregation from the previous year and all of our finances. And during the annual report, we're going to be selecting two new members to serve on our board of deacons and trustees. There are two deacon seats that are coming open, and we're going to re be receiving nominations for from the congregation on Sunday the 8th of February and Sunday the 15th of February. Uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to nominate people to serve on the board. The list of qualifications for board members is printed in your bulletin and uh, you must be a member of Harvest Time to serve on the board and you must be a member to nominate someone to serve on the board and you can be praying if you're a member about whom you might nominate. I uh, want to just say a quick word about the missions trip to Ukraine. Uh, this is with Denise's dad and her uncle Stan. Uh, we're going to be doing a children's uh, VBS program for kids from 8 to 11. Um, visiting a special needs uh, orphanage, which is a really special, special place, and doing a lot of other great work. Maybe you should pray about going on a Harvest Time missions trip this year. If you've never been on one, I want to tell you that it is absolutely a life-changing experience. Um, we go and we leave a deposit wherever we go, but I find that uh, a deposit is also made in us. Um, you've heard about Ukraine in the news. There's been a lot of trouble on the far eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, we're going to the western side of Ukraine. I was there with my son um, just a couple months ago, and it's very quiet. As long as everything stays as it is right now, it's very quiet uh, in the western part. And maybe you should pray about being part of the interest meeting on Thursday. Uh, and then very quickly, we're in our final week of fasting together as a congregation, leading up to our first fire in the night of the new year this coming Friday evening. Evening, starting at 6 p.m., going all through the night to 6 o'clock the next morning. And we'd love for you to come and just spend a little time with us on Friday evening. Get here whenever you can. Stay as long as you'd like to stay and pray with us. All right, look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And let's talk about being in it to win it. 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 19. Paul says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a love slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run hard, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Let's pray and just invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. Father, I just ask that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen and amen. Just before we look at these verses, I want to ask for your prayers for this coming week and for your partnership. Our friend, Pastor Raymond Mui, has invited me to join him on a missions trip to the country of Myanmar. Uh, you might know that country better by the name Burma. Brian Kelly and I are going to be leaving later this week. I'm going to be ministering in some local churches next weekend. And then Pastor Raymond and I are going to be teaching a two-day pastor's conference for pastors from all over the country. And then Pastor Raymond is doing a three-day gospel crusade. I want to tell you it is absolutely a miracle 
that he has received a permit from the government to do open air meetings in the capital city of Yangon. Uh, Myanmar is run by a military dictatorship and it's just a favor of the Lord that he has uh, gotten the permit to do these meetings. They're expecting over 25,000 people each night in the crusade. Just after I left Indonesia last summer, Pastor Raymond came behind me and did an open air meeting. They had many thousands of people every night and at the end of each meeting, there's an opportunity for people to accept Christ. And if Muslim men accept the Lord, they ask them to take their prayer caps that they wear and throw them down on the ground and leave them behind when they leave the crusade grounds. And then the staff goes through and they collect all the caps, and that's how they count how many conversions there were, only counting the men, not even counting the women. And it's in the tens of thousands every night uh, of the crusade. So at the end of the service today, I'm just asking if you would help Harvest Time to sow a very good seed into this crusade in Myanmar. The budget for the conference and the crusade is $80,000. Uh, Pastor Raymond has told me that the church in Myanmar has raised 35000 of that. And Pastor Raymond is committed to raising the rest. And I want to be able to take a good offering from harvest time. So while we share the word for a few minutes this morning, I want to ask if you just pray about sharing in that offering. There's an extra offering envelope in your bulletin this morning. You can use that to give. Uh, if you'd like to take credit for giving by cash, slip it in the offering envelope. Or if you'd like to give by check or credit or debit card, you can use the envelope to do that. Last week, we started looking at chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians. They deal with an issue that is pretty foreign to us. They deal with the problem of meat sold in the market that was offered first as a sacrifice to a pagan idol. You know, that is still a problem for some believers in the world today, but for us, it's not even remotely an issue. Nevertheless, I want to tell you that chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians are some of the most helpful chapters in the entire New Testament because they help us to know how to handle the problem of gray areas. My sermon last week was called Graying Gracefully, and for the 900 of you that couldn't make it here because of the ice, we've made CDs of the sermon to give away to you and you can get them on the Welcome Center if you'd like to have them or you can listen to the audio on our website or you can uh, look at the video on our YouTube channel I do want to tell you it's a, it's a message worth hearing Paul's answer to the problem of idle meat begins in chapter 8 and it runs all the way through the end of chapter 10 last week we looked at chapter 8 and chapter 10 and here in the middle is chapter 9 at first glance, it appears like Paul gets off track. He begins talking about how he surrendered his right to receive compensation for ministering the gospel in Corinth. And then he goes into these verses that we read this morning, uh, becoming like all to win all and running to win. And even though at first glance it doesn't appear like it all fits together, it actually does quite beautifully. You see, by surrendering his right to receive compensation, Paul is illustrating two of the key principles for navigating gray areas. One of them is the principle of love, sensitivity to others, and the other is the principle of evangelism. Paul closes chapter 8 saying, if it offends my brother, I would never eat meat again. And then in chapter 9, he begins by pointing out that out of love, he has sacrificed something much bigger than a stake. He has sacrificed his entire salary. And then at the end of chapter 9, we come to these very well-known and loved verses where Paul compares the Christian life to a race. Corinth was the home of the Isthmian Games. After the Olympic Games, these were the most famous games in the Roman Empire. They were held every two years and athletes competed in six different sporting events. Two of them were running and boxing that Paul mentions here. It is believed that these games were going on while Paul was in Corinth in the spring of AD 51. And actually the athletes and the tens of thousands of people from out of town that descended on the city uh, for the games stayed in tents. And if you remember, Paul, rather than taking a salary from the Corinthians, Paul was working as a tent maker, so there was a boom in the tent business. 
So perhaps there's a reason why Paul mentions his foregoing his salary and his thoughts immediately turn to the games. Everyone in Corinth knew about the extreme discipline and the extreme focus and exertion of the athletes, just like we know about it from watching the Olympics. Paul says they are in it to win it. And Paul says that this is the way that we should apply ourselves to our new relationship with Christ. Run in such a way so as to win the prize. Be in it to win it. I have a question from the Holy Spirit this morning. When you think about your relationship with Christ, are you in it to win it right now? Are you pursuing Christ with passion and focus? Are you captivated by Jesus? Are you thrilled by Jesus? Are you hungry and thirsty to become more like Christ? Are you living for Christ with a clear sense of eternal purpose? If we could take your spiritual condition and translate it into a televised athletic competition, on what show would you appear? Would we find you in the Rio Olympics next summer? Or would we find you on the next season of The Biggest Loser? God says, be in it to win it. Looking at Paul's words here, there are two questions that come to my mind. First of all, why should we run this race? Why should we run this race? Think about the dedication of Olympic athletes. Think about their entire devotion to their sport. Everything in their lives revolves around their training. Think about the extreme sacrifices that they make, the investment of time and money and heart. Think about the sheer determination that gets them up morning after morning at zero dark 30 to go push their bodies. And this is how I'm supposed to apply myself to pursuing Christ. Why? Well, Paul says it's because they do it to perhaps win a crown that will wilt, but we do it to win something far better. Athletes in the Isthmian Games didn't win a gold medal. They won a crown that was made out of leaves. In fact, in Paul's day, the crowns were made out of celery greens. There was no gold medal, there was no silver medal, there was no bronze medal, only one winner of a celery crown. All that sacrifice, all that discipline, all that focus, all that expense, all that exertion and the prize was celery. You're wondering why I gave you celery this morning. It's because the sermon's so long you're going to need a snack to get you through to the, to the end of it. There's no dip either. <laughs> Came across something good about celery the other day. It said celery is 95% water and 100% not pizza. <laughs> but doesn't that say a lot about the things for which people expend their lives? In the end, all of it is just a big bunch of celery. Paul enumerates all the rights that he sacrificed out of love. And they are precisely the kind of celery that many people spend their lives running after. Paul said, I sacrificed my right to find food and drink. I sacrificed my right to luxurious housing, travel, income and profits. Professional success, recognition, respect, sexual fulfillment, sexual conquest, athletic fitness, athletic accomplishments, some hobby, some skill. Paul says, in light of eternity, all of it is just celery. Actually, I find a double downer for people who spend their lives in pursuit of these things. First of all, very few are winners. Paul said they all run with all their might, but only one wins. There is no silver. There is no bronze. Second place is first loser. <laughs> and if you think about it, very, very few people ever reach a place where they're satisfied with what they've attained. Most people who chase after celery with all their might go home losers. 
The second downer is that whatever is attained just doesn't last. The satisfaction doesn't last. The enjoyment doesn't last. Paul is saying, think of it. They pour so much into it and only one wins and what he wins is just celery that doesn't last. But we have a much better reason to run. We have a much better reason to passionately pursue Christ. We have a much better reason to live with purpose and focus. We have a much better reason to sacrifice and invest. We have much better prizes to win. Why should we run this race? Well, first of all, Paul says to participate in the blessings of the gospel. Unlike the Isthmian games, where there's only one winner, everyone who participates in Christ and finishes their race comes out a winner. And along the way, we get to enjoy prizes for participating. We get to enjoy the blessings of the gospel. What are those? Well, for one thing, we get to enjoy being united with Christ by faith in a beautiful bond of intimate relationship in a way that I really can't even explain to you. Christ and I become part of one another. Like a vine and its branches, like a head and its body, like the one flesh union between a husband and a wife. And because Christ and I are part of one another, in a way that I really can't explain to you, Christ's physical experiences in the cross and the resurrection become my spiritual experiences. My sin nature is crucified with Christ on the cross and my spirit, which was dead in trespasses and sin, comes alive in him. What are the blessings of the gospel? Well, because we're united with Christ, an exchange takes place whereby our sins and all the punishment that they deserved are transferred onto Christ on the cross and all of his beautiful righteousness and all the rewards from God that it merits are transferred onto me. We are now innocent by association. Although we still sin, God no longer regards us as sinner or counts our sins against us. David said, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, whose sins are covered. What are the blessings of the gospel? Well, because I've been united with Christ by faith and because my sins have been removed from me, God sends the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of my heart. The Holy Spirit brings the living presence of God into my physical body. You know, if you sat and reflected on that for a few minutes, that would make you speak in tongues. The God who made everything you see, the God who made everything that is, is living inside of you by the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit inside of our heart changes our heart. He pours the love of God into our heart. He assures us that the Father loves us, that we belong to the Father, that the Father belongs to us. He assures us of that bond of relationship. There's a cry that comes out of our spirit, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit communicates the mind of Christ to us, helps us think like Christ, helps us to know what is the will of the Father. He enables us to live as overcomers. He is the one that keeps our sin nature crucified on the cross with Christ and keeps our spirit alive in Him. What are the blessings of the gospel? Well, because we are united with Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, we too become sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. We become part of a blessed family on earth. We become part of a blessing family on earth. God said to Abraham, I will be God to you and to your descendants after you. That's you and me. Beloved, when God is your God, he works for you with all of his might. God said to Abraham, don't be afraid, Abraham. I will be your shield and your very great reward. When God is your God, he will help you through this life. When God is your God, he will guide you through this life. When God is your God, he will provide for you. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging for bread. 
When God is your God, He will protect you. When God is your God, He will cause you to prevail over your enemies, both earthly and spiritual. God said to Abraham, your children shall possess the gates of their enemies. That's me and you. We shall possess the gates of our enemies. When God is your God, he'll help your kids too. His blessings will fall on them too. He'll guide and provide and protect them too. He'll bring your kids good spouses. When Abraham's servant Eliezer went looking for a bride for Isaac, the Holy Spirit led him to beautiful Rebekah. And Eliezer said, Blessed be the Lord God of Abraham who hasn't forgotten his steadfast love toward my master. When God is your God, he'll pursue you with goodness and mercy all the days of your life. Why should I run? Well, because I get to participate in all of these amazing blessings of the gospel in this life, and I haven't even told you half of what I could have. Why should we run this race? Another thing I find that Paul says is to win the prize of heaven. To win the prize of heaven. Paul says, run in such a way as to win the prize. There's only one other place in Paul's letter where he mentions the prize. That's in Philippians 3. And Paul says there that the prize is heaven. He said, I press forward to lay hold of it. The running and fighting of the Christian life is a running and fighting for eternal life. Paul wrote to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith and take hold of eternal life. Now listen to me. Listen how it works. Here's the thing. We don't run to obtain salvation, but we run because we have been obtained by Jesus. Paul said, not that I have already obtained my goal, not that I have already stepped in and entered into that life, but I press to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. We're not saved by our own efforts. We're saved only through grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. But the evidence of our salvation is that we no longer run after celery, but now we run after Christ. Our running doesn't nullify the purpose of grace. It verifies the power of grace. We run because we've been saved by Him. Amen. Beloved, listen to me. What could possibly be more important in this life than to be sure that you are on course to win the prize of heaven. Jesus said, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. He said, labor for the food that endures to eternal life. Peter said, make every effort to add to your faith so that you will receive a hero's welcome home into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior. He said, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Hebrews says, make every effort to enter into his rest. You know, in light of eternity, this life is just a brief vapor. All too soon, our race has been run. And what could possibly be more important than being sure that you're ready to meet God and to be welcomed home into His presence? When you're lying on your deathbed, what earthly accomplishment could possibly compare with the prize of eternal life? About four months ago, we received the news that my dad was battling cancer that had metastasized all over his body. My dad fought very bravely while his body kept growing weaker and weaker. This past Monday, he was moved to the hospital and on Wednesday, he was moved to hospice. My dad had a lot of notable and truly noble accomplishments in his life. But sitting by his bedside this last week, there was only one thing that mattered to me. I have to tell you, didn't even matter whether or not he had invested enough time in his family or whether he had made peace with everyone. People say family will be the only thing that matters in the end. Family is important, but it is not the only thing that matters. The only thing that mattered to me was whether or not dad had taken hold of the prize of eternal life. 
I received word very late Friday evening that my dad finished his race. He asked for me to pray for him numerous times over the last four months and every time I prayed for him he cried and that always made me cry too. When I prayed for him the last time this last week he cried one more time and he looked into my eyes and he said, Glenn, I know God will take me into his hands. Do you know? Do you know that you know that you know that you're ready? You see, not everybody gets four months to think about it. Not everybody gets four months of suffering to convince them that everything else but Jesus is really just celery. Not everyone gets four months of their kids praying for them and sending sermon CDs and writing letters. My dad has a son who's a pastor. My sister and her husband are pastors in the suburbs of Chicago. My sister Laurie is a deacon, a leader in her church, loves the Lord. My dad didn't have a chance. We were all barraging him. But some people get no advance warning at all. The last thing running through their mind is the first thing that they have to answer for in the presence of Christ. Have you entered through the narrow door of salvation? Are you traveling the narrow path that Jesus said leads to the destination called eternal life? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? That's why we run this race. Because nothing else is more important than heaven. Why should we run this race? Another thing Paul says is to receive an everlasting crown of righteousness. Paul says that people spend their lives chasing after a celery crown that wither, but we are running to win a crown that will last forever. In 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul elaborates on the crown. He wrote there, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is waiting for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but on all those who longed for his appearing. You see, in that moment that we go home to be with Jesus, a process that has been going on throughout our entire life will finally be completed. Right now, in Christ, we are righteous by association. We still sin, but because we're hidden in Christ, God doesn't regard us as sinners, nor count our sins against us. But listen to me, during this life, sin remains a clear and present danger for us. We can go backwards into sin to the point that we can be disqualified from the prize. The last verse of chapter 9 has caused no small controversy among theologians. Lest I, after having preached to others, should become disqualified. Not everyone agrees on what disqualified means, but I would submit to you that this is a deadly serious warning on the part of Paul. And whatever disqualified means, I can assure you it is something really, really bad that we don't want to happen to us. But in that moment, when we go to be with Jesus, the danger of being disqualified is removed from us forever. God will complete the work of making us righteous in Christ, and we will enter into a perfected state. Our lifelong battle with sin will finally be done once and for all. We will receive a crown of righteousness that will last forever. In other words, God will confer on us everlasting righteousness. Never again will we have to worry about grieving Him. Never again will we have to worry about falling into temptation. Never again will we have to worry about failing Him or about being disqualified. So we run this race hungering and thirsting after that crown of permanent righteousness. Why should we run this race? One more thing I find is to win, 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 and then save some. Verses 19 through 23 are the heart of chapters 8, 9, and 10. Paul shares the principle that underlies everything he does, that underlies all of his decisions. 
He runs like he does so that he himself can participate in the blessings of the gospel. And he runs like he does so that he can lead as many others as possible into those blessings too. This is the underlying principle that guides us through the gray area of idle meat and every other gray area that we might encounter in life. I make myself a love slave to all men to win them. I'm sensitive to kosher observant Jews to win them. I'm sensitive to kosher observant Gentiles to win them. I'm sensitive to non-observant Gentiles to win them. I'm sensitive to those with overactive consciences, the weak, to win them. I have become all things to all men, so that by all means possible, I might save some. Maybe there's an important pattern that we should notice in Paul's words. Before Paul tries to save some, he does everything he can to win, 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 win them over. He does everything he can to connect with them on common ground. He does everything he can to befriend them. He does everything he can to serve them in love. He does everything he can to understand the spiritual questions in their hearts so that he can give an answer when God gives him that opportunity. He genuinely cares and he does everything he can to show it. Beloved, listen, before people can be led to salvation in Christ, they need to be won over. Their friendship needs to be won. Their trust needs to be won. I don't know whether you've noticed, but born-again Christians don't exactly have a great reputation out there. Before we can lead them to Christ, their respect needs to be won. And what would happen if before we tried to save people, we extended ourselves in genuine friendship to win, 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 win them first? Years ago, the guy who cut my hair was a young dad named Joe. He was in his early 30s. His wife had two small girls. And they just moved to a new apartment in Stamford, far away from their family. Like most adult men, Joe had drifted away from his drinking buddies of his early 20s and was really quite alone. One day he met a guy in the elevator of his building and they chatted for a few minutes and the guy said to him, hey, let's get together for coffee sometime. Joe thought to himself, hey, maybe this is someone who could be a friend. They met a few days later at a Dunkin' Donuts in Stamford and after a few minutes of small talk, the guy launched into a sales pitch for Amway. Joe felt like such a dupe. He was looking for a friend, but his new friend was looking for a sale. Beloved, with no disrespect to Amway, when it comes to people's eternal destinies, let's not be like Amway salesmen. The goal is not just to close a deal. The goal is to incarnate the love of God to people through the pursuit of genuine friendships. I sat in Joe's chair once a month for over five years talking with him about his wife and about his girls and about his crazy Italian family and they were crazy. We laughed together. We talked about the things that concerned us as dads and husbands. When our twins were born prematurely we were renovating an old house that should have been put out of its misery. But Joe came on his days off to help us paint the new house. And one day, sitting in his chair, I had the privilege of leading Joe to salvation in Jesus Christ. He started crying. He was cutting my hair. I said, Joe, stop cutting till you're finished crying. I don't want to be all crook. <laughs> so how about you? Who are you trying to win, 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 win right now? Two questions about Paul's words. Why should we run this race? And the second question is, how should we run this race? Worship team, come and help me as I finish up. How should we run this race? How should we live this life for Christ? Paul draws two illustrations from the Isthmian games. One has to do with self-denial and the other has to do with exertion. How should we run this race? First of all, we should run this race with extreme spirit 
control. When I was in college, I worked with a guy who was a competitive bodybuilder. And in his work clothes, he didn't really look that huge, but if you saw his competition pictures, he was the most cut, defined person that I've ever known. For months on end, he ate an extreme restrictive diet. Basically, if it tasted good, he couldn't eat it. And he did all of that just in hopes of placing a little higher on the leaderboard each time. The day after a competition, he would go on a binge and he would eat everything that he had been denying himself for months. And then the next day, he would go right back to preparing for the next competition. Listen, if an athlete can exercise that much self-control over his body just for a shot at winning some salary, how much more should we exercise self-control to win the prize of heaven and the everlasting crown of righteousness? Paul said, I bruise my body so that I won't become disqualified. He's not only speaking of his physical body there, he, he's speaking of his entire self. I rein myself in. I, I keep myself in check. My thoughts, my emotions, my decisions, my relationships, all of my life I keep in check to win the prize. Only there's a twist for us. We don't exercise self-control in our own strength. Actually, self-control is a bit of a misnomer because Paul says in Galatians 2 that, uh, Galatians 5, that self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Self-control is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. Self-control is the work of the Holy Spirit exerting His influence over our thinking and our emotions and over our will. So it's not really self-control at all. It is spirit control. I don't live in check by my own willpower. I live in check by His power. How should we run this race? With extreme spirit control and second, with rigorous training in righteousness. Athletes do more than just deny themselves junk food. They exert themselves to constantly grow stronger and to perform better. And we should do the same under the Spirit's control. We avoid everything that diminishes our spiritual strength and we invest in everything that makes us stronger. Serious athletes don't just try to get through a workout. They avidly go after whatever will cause them to perform at peak. Athletes in the Isthmian Games were required to verify that they had trained for 10 months prior to coming to Corinth. A trainer had to certify to a race official that they had adhered to the strict disciplines and standards. And if they couldn't verify it, they were disqualified from competing in the race. You know, that gives me an idea. What if we took a 10-month challenge? This is the last weekend in January. But what if we committed to setting aside the next 10 months to training for this race? That would take us from now right through Thanksgiving weekend. And what if over the next 10 months we invited the Holy Spirit to come and help us exercise extreme spirit control over everything in our lives that is sapping our spiritual strength? That might mean surrendering some gray areas that you certainly have the right to but are doing nothing to help you get stronger. Paul said, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything makes me stronger. What if we invited the Holy Spirit to come and exercise spirit control so that those things that are sapping our spiritual strength away were cut off from us? And what if we also committed to doing everything that will help us grow spiritually stronger? Listen, if an athlete can get up at zero dark 30 and go out in the cold to push his body on a track, then I suppose that we could get up at zero dark 30 and sit in a soft chair and read our Bible and pray. Between his 12th and 13th birthday, my son Ben read through the entire Bible. Denise and I are so proud of him. 
And if my 12-year-old can read through his Bible in a year, then I know that you could too. What have you really engaged in the life of this church for the next 10 months? What have you committed to being here every weekend? What have you committed to Pathways Ministry on Tuesday nights? What have you committed to Wednesday night, the youth group, the children's programs, Pastor Nick's great study on the book of Psalms? What have you committed to serving? What have you exerted yourself to creating an atmosphere of worship around you, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week? What have you exerted yourself to grow in your prayer life? You know, one of the best ways to grow in your prayer life is to pray along with other people. If you're training, they tell you to train with someone stronger than you, and you'll get stronger faster. If you want to grow in your prayer life, pray with people who are a little more advanced with you, and you'll grow in your prayer life. We have a bunch of prayer groups. We have a women's group that meets at 1230 on Wednesdays. Debbie said all are welcome if you're free at that time. We have lots of other prayer groups. We can make as many new prayer groups as you'd like us to add. But listen, think about this. I'm almost done. If you went on a strict regimen, a strict nutrition regimen, and, and a strict routine of training, if you did that for 10 months, how different would you look by Thanksgiving? And what difference would it make in your life? By the same token, if you submitted yourself to extreme spirit control and you pursued rigorous training and righteousness, how different would you look by Thanksgiving? And what difference would it make in your life? A simple question from the Holy Spirit today. Are you in it to win it? Why are you running this race? And how are you running this race? Would you stand on your feet? Would you give Jesus, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place today? Come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Let's give Jesus a great big praise in this place.